We are continuing this morning a series through the book of Exodus. We come this morning to uh, the beginning of this uh, famous encounter that Moses has with the Lord at the bush. And so, starting at verse 1 of chapter 3 in Exodus, we'll be reading through to verse 12. Hear now the word of our God. Now Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian, And he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked, and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, Here I am. Then he said, Do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Jacob, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt, and have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. And I, come, I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians, and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And now behold, the cry of the people of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppressed them. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, But I will be with you, and this shall be the sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. True and living God, would you give light to our minds and enliven our hearts to receive the truth of your word this morning by faith, that we might lay it up in our hearts and practice it in our lives to the glory of Jesus, our great King, in whose name we pray. Amen. Well, as many of you know, we have a baby boy who is due to be born today. Uh, actually, I have my. I normally don't do this, but I brought my phone this morning. Yvonne is at home resting, uh, so if I get a text during the sermon, that'll be my cue to make my exodus out of this building. Uh, so babies do today, right? Uh, and so waiting for this kid to make his public appearance sort of got me thinking throughout this week as I was reflecting on this passage in Exodus chapter three what it means to be made in the image of God, right? What what does it mean that we are created in the image of God? Because my son, even before he makes his public appearance, right? uh, My son, as all human beings are from the moment of conception, are created in God's very image. Just amazing to think, isn't it? But what does that mean? I think that part of it, there are lots of things involved there, but I think that part of it is something that we could very easily miss just because it's so simple. And that is the simple fact that we are living beings. Our God is said in Scripture to be the living God. And we are His living image bearers, right? Uh, Genesis chapter 2, when the Lord created Adam. What does it say? It says, He breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. We are living image bearers of the living God. And this this contrasts our God with all the the false gods uh, that we are so prone to want to worship. And their images, right? Psalm 135, uh, verses 15 through 18 is one passage that's very interesting. And it goes like this, thinking about what it means to be the image of God. Psalm 135 Verses 15 through 18 says that the idols of the nations are silver and gold, the work of human hands. They have mouths, but do not speak. They have eyes, but do not see. 
They have ears, but do not hear, nor is there any breath in their mouths, and those who make them become like them, so do all who trust in them. What is that saying? It's saying that the images of all of these gods are what? They are dead. They have an appearance, you know, they're just dead statues. There's no light. They have eyes, they don't see, ears don't hear, mouths don't speak. Uh, all of these things, there, there's no breath in them, there is no spirit, there is no life that, that gives life to these images. And so you see the living God, uh, the, the one who has all life in himself, in contrast to all other gods, he has made a living image of himself in us, in the people that he has created. One of the reasons that we are not to make for ourselves any image of God. He has already made an image, right? Uh, in fact, we heard earlier from Luke chapter 20, verse 38, the Lord Jesus telling us that this is actually one of the things uh, that is taught by Moses in this passage about the burning bush. Very, just amazing what you hear the Lord Jesus saying there. As he tells us there in Matthew 20, verse 38, that when the Lord told Moses in Exodus 3, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, what is he indicating? He is indicating that he is the God, not of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Not the God of the dead, but of the living. He is the living God. And that's what I want to focus on this morning with you as we look at this passage in Exodus chapter 3, the beginning of this amazing encounter that Moses has with this living God at the burning bush. What does it mean for us that our God is the living God? Three things I want to point out. First, God is life in himself. Second, God is life for us. Third, God is life for the mission. In himself, for us, for the mission. First, God is life in himself. Verses 1 through 5. Remember the background here, right? Uh, the people of Israel have been ruthlessly enslaved by the Egyptians for many, many years. Last week we saw how Moses... Uh, fled to Midian because he saved an Israelite from the hand of an Egyptian by killing the Egyptian. Uh, and there in Midian, he, go, he gets married, right? He has a child, he starts a family, and now, picking up the be at the beginning of, of chapter 3, he is still there in Midian as a, as a sojourner in a, in a foreign land. He has been there for 40 years. He's been there for 40 years. And as chapter 3 picks up, we find him out there in the wilderness of Midian, and what is he doing? He, he is doing what presumably is the very thing that he's been doing for the past 40 years of his life. He is keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro. By the way, Jethro, same God that was the same guy that was called Ruel in chapter 2. Same guy, two different names, Ruel, Jethro. And you have to think, right, you know, how many days before this point? Had Moses done this before? Uh, presumably, again, same thing that he's been doing for 40 years, getting up, going out to the sheep, leading them around the wilderness, hearing the wonderful sheep noises, smelling the wonderful sheep smells, right? Uh, day after day in the sweltering Middle Eastern sun. You know, this life, you think about your life, it can be so monotonous and mundane, can it? It, sort of, it can beat you down over time. It, it, it can sort of lull you to sleep. You know, you, you just start going through the motions. Get up, start the coffee pot, uh, drink as much coffee that you can get into your body in the allotted amount of time, uh, eat the same breakfast that you eat every other day, same routine, same route to go to school, to work, whatever you spend your days doing, right? Same old thing over and over again. And if you're like me, you, sometimes it's just like, again, same old thing, again, same routine. Isn't there more to life than this routine that I have day after day? You need to see, beloved. You need to see that when you are following the living God, when you are walking with the living God, and you need to remind yourself proactively of this truth every single day of your life. When you are walking with the living God, there is life in everything that you do. 
God breathes life even into the mundane, seemingly mundane routines of our lives that we go through over and over and over again. There is life in it because the eyes of the living God are always upon you. He, he breathes his life into you and into the very things that you do. You live as his child. You live as one who is being guided in your life uh, to what God has for you. Because, and, and, and so, because it is all going somewhere, right? There, there is purpose in every detail of your life. Uh, that's why uh, Paul in 1 Corinthians 15, 58 says, Be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is what? Not in vain. Nothing you do in the Lord can be in vain. For Moses, the big place that this day after day routine out with the sheep was, was leading was to this encounter that we have here in Exodus chapter 3 with the living God. Forty years after he had arrived in Midian. But here's the thing. Uh, there's an interesting deta detail here that you cannot miss. Uh, even before God speaks to Moses, get this, as Moses is tending the sheep, where does he bring them? He brings them to Mount Horeb, also known as Mount Sinai, which is what? The same mountain that he is going to lead the people of Israel to in the exodus out of Egypt. As, you know, the, the, those 40 years of tending the sheep have prepared Moses for the great work that God will have him do. He couldn't know that until this encounter with God at the bush. But it was it, the, the tending of another man's sheep was preparing Moses to lead the sheep of the Lord through the wilderness to this very mountain. The end of Psalm 77 actually uses this very language. It says, Psalm 77 verse 20, You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. Moses will still be a shepherd in the Exodus. He's going to lead the sheep of the Lord's people, not the sheep of his father-in-law Jethro. Lovingly guided all along the way by the living God. And it says... Verses 2 and 3. The angel of the Lord appeared in the, form, uh, in the form of fire out of the midst of a bush. And the bush was burning, but it was not consumed. Now it says here, the angel of the Lord. But as we, as we read on, it becomes very clear. This angel of the Lord is, is identified with the Lord himself. And a lot of different opinions about the identity of this angel of the Lord. I don't have the time this morning to, get, to go through all of it. But it is my opinion that this angel of the Lord is an appearance of of the Word who was in the beginning with God and who is God before His incarnation. In other words, a pre-incarnate appearance of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now I want you to see here, there is a lesson for us then about the Lord in this bush. Don't miss this, right? The thing that really grabs Moses' attention about this fire is what? It's not the fire itself. He's not, you know, no doubt Moses has seen lots of wildfires out there in the wilderness of Midian as he's leading the sheep, right? It's not the fact that there is a fire. It is what? It's, a fa it's the fact that there is a fire and the bush is not consumed. What's amazing about that? Well, it's, it's amazing because fire depends on the material that it burns for its existence. And when the, and when the material burns out, what happens? The fire dies. This is a living fire. This is a fire that doesn't die. This is a fire that is not dependent upon the material that it is, it is with for its existence. It is a fire that is independent of anything in this creation for its existence. It is a self-sustaining fire. That is unlike any created fire that you or I have ever seen. It is astounding to Moses, and rightly so. You see, the fire itself, beloved, is a revelation of the living God. The God who is present in the world, but who exists independently of the world, who has all life in himself, the very one that we confessed earlier. You might have been wondering, why are we reading this chapter from the Westminster Confession of Faith this morning? This is why. It's, this is the God who we confessed in these words earlier, who has all life, glory, goodness, and blessedness in and of himself. 
in and of himself, not dependent on anything outside of himself, and who alone in and of himself is all sufficient, not standing in need of any creatures that he has made, nor deriving any glory from them, but only manifesting his own glory in, by, unto, and upon them. That is the God that Moses meet, meets in this, we might say, unburning bush, because the bush did not burn, yet the fire was there, imminent and transcendent, high above us, and so very close to us. And so, verses 4 and 5, after seeing the fire, we hear something absolutely thrilling. After 400 years of silence, 400 years, the living God speaks. When the Lord saw that Moses turned aside to see, God called him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. The last time God spoke was 400 years earlier. Genesis chapter 46, verse 2, he said to Jacob, 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 and Jacob said, here I am. Here now, 400 years later, what Moses, Moses, here I am. Which brings us then to the second point. God is life for us. God is life for us. Verse 6, the Lord identifies himself to Moses as the covenant-keeping God of promise. I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. Moses, do you remember that story? But what happens? Moses hides his face in fear, but the Lord immediately assures Moses of the purpose of this encounter. This is for good and for salvation. It's not to do Moses harm. And he says in verses 7 and 8, the Lord said, I, I have surely seen the affliction of my people who are in Egypt. And I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of, of the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey. Four verbs. I have seen. I have heard. I know. And I have come down. So much meaning in those four verbs, beloved. You see, what comfort is there for you for you to know that your God is the living God, that he has all life in himself, that he is not dependent on anything outside of himself? It is this. Because that is true, his ears are always open. Because that is true, his eyes are always upon you. Because that is true, he is always, he never stops caring and protecting and guiding. Beloved, God is not dependent on anything outside of himself so that you and I can always, every moment of every single day, be dependent upon him. That is so much, there is so much comfort and assurance in knowing that. You know, I love my children, right? I, I just absolutely adore my children. I would do anything within my power, within my power to, to protect them, to teach them, to guide them in their lives. But you see, there are times in every single day when because I am dependent upon things outside of myself for both my existence and for their existence, you know, food, sleep, these sorts of things, I need at every single day, I need at times to take my eyes off of my children and put my eyes on other things, right? I need to work. I need to put them to bed. I need to go to my own room and go to bed and hopefully not see them again until the next morning, right? Uh, not so with God. Not so with God. He does not grow tired. He doesn't need to go to bed. He doesn't grow weary. He doesn't need to sleep. You, you can rest knowing that your God needs no rest. You can rest, sleep. You can sleep knowing that your God is not sleeping, right? Psalm 121 makes this very point. He who keeps you will not slumber. Behold, he who keeps Israel will neither slumber nor sleep. Your God doesn't sleep. Why? Because he is not dependent upon anything outside of himself. Amen? 
And so Exodus 3, 7, this living God, He assures Moses, I have surely seen, I have heard their cries, I know their suffering, and I have come down. I want you to think again about that passage in Psalm 135 that I started off with, right? Uh, that passage about the eyes and do not see, all that sort of thing. The idols of the nations have mouths but do not speak. Moses here has seen no mouth and yet his God speaks. They have eyes but do not see. Moses here has seen no eyes and yet his God sees. They have ears but do not hear. Moses has seen no ears but his God has heard. They have hands and they do not act. Moses here has seen no hands and yet his God has come down to deliver his people with what? A mighty hand and an outstretched arm. The God's beloved that we want to worship, they have no life and they can give us no life. They are dead and so are all who trust in them. The living God the one who made us in his image, who comes to us, is a God that we cannot see with our eyes, but he at the very same time has all life, and he alone can give us life. Do you need life today? Are you trapped in that feeling like there is just nothing here? There has to be more. Jesus said, this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have said. If you need life, look to the one, the only one who has it in himself. And that you might know, beloved, the depth of his life and his love. This very God came into our world and he has taken upon himself human eyes. He has taken upon himself human ears. He has, he has taken upon himself a human voice, our voice, and hands and feet in the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. For as he did in Exodus, so in Jesus our God came down to bring us up. Amen? Amen. But in a way, get this, in a way far more meaningful and wonderful than any of us could ever possibly have imagined, He descended into our world and into our very flesh and into the depths of the grave itself to bring us up from there to the highest heaven, the very dwelling place of our God. Because you see, just like this uncreated heavenly fire was with the bush without consuming the bush, so the heavenly divine nature of our Lord Jesus Christ was with the human nature without consuming the human nature, but to bring, to raise us up to his throne in heaven. And the amazing thing is that right now, he has bound himself to you and me without consuming us. You can be united through Jesus with God without being consumed. Amazing to think. The God who is a consuming fire has come to save you in His great mercy. And remember the uh, Pentecost, Acts chapter 2, when the Holy Spirit comes down on the apostles. In what? Flaming tongues of fire. The fire comes upon them and they were not consumed. But what happened? They were empowered for the mission that God had entrusted, entrusted to them. And they were sent out with the message of salvation just as he comes upon you and me now and fills up and fills us up and sends us out with the message of salvation which brings us to the last point God is life for the mission so at this point Moses right think about this guy uh, you gotta think that he's just sort of overjoyed right now with the good news uh, God is going to come save his people. Great, awesome, sweet. Let me pull up a chair. When's it going to happen? Let me pull up a chair and I can sit and watch. Right? No. Uh, what does the Lord go on to say? He adds something else. Verse 10. Come. Verse 10. Come, I will send you to Pharaoh that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. Uh, and Moses is like, wait, what? <laughs> Who, me? Are you serious? You can't be serious, can you, God? Uh, verse 11, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of... Can't you do it yourself? 
What do you need me for? And yes, the, the, the thing is, God very well could do it himself, but he wants to use Moses just like he wants to use you. And we are so very prone to respond in the exact same way as Moses does, aren't we? Uh, you know, the task is so great. What can I do? And see, that is the people that God wants to use. No, I, I'm nothing. God is everything, right? And he wants to use me. So the Lord, uh, his promise to Moses here, it, listen, it, it's not, and you've got to see this, it's not, hey Moses, uh, don't, ha don't be so down on yourself, right? The Lord doesn't say, Moses, you know, don't you know Moses? You can do anything that you want if you just set your mind to it. Uh, Moses, you can be anything you want if you try really, really hard. No, that's not the Lord's response. The Lord's response is what? But I will be with you. That's what we need to see. Not I am so great and I can do it, but my God is so great and my God can do it and he is with me. You see, what we need, beloved, is not more self-confidence. What we need is God confidence. What we need is God confidence. Um, you know, earlier this week, we, uh, P Becky, Peggy, Angel, and I were talking at staff meeting about how can we rest in the Lord even as we work for the Lord? How can you have the rest of Jesus even as you are trying your hardest to follow Jesus? And really, you see, this is the only way. This is the only way. Be encouraged by this today, beloved. The work is ultimately in His hands. The power is with Him. The results are in His hands. He is the living God. And He is the God who is with me. Who am I? Nothing. Who is my God? Everything. He is the living God. He is the great I Am. And He is the God who calls things that are not as though they are. He is the God who chooses the foolish things of this world to confound the wise. He is the God who, 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 to, who, who uses things who are nothing in this world to confound the things that are. He chooses was a shepherd who spent 40 years of his life in exile to confound a king of the greatest kingdom on earth. Amazing. With this one simple promise, but I will be with you. Why? Because he is life in himself. He is life for you. And he is life for the mission. So what does that mean for you today? Uh, what does that mean for you tomorrow? What does that mean for you on hump day, Wednesday afternoon? What, is, what does this mean for you as you go about these mundane routines of your daily life? Well, back to the beginning, beloved. Moses led his flock to, the Mount, to Mount Sinai, just going about uh, the daily work that the Lord had entrusted to him. And it was in that mundane daily routine that the Lord met him. It was in that that the Lord met him. If he wasn't out there tending the sheep, he wouldn't have been at Mount Horeb. No matter how insignificant the details of your daily life may seem, beloved, there is nothing that is meaningless in reality. For you serve the living God. And this living God, his eyes are always upon you and his ears are always open to you. And as you sojourn and as you follow him and as you engage in his mission in the world to love other people and to make disciples in his name, you have, you need to see, the very same promise that the Lord gave to Moses in Exodus 3. Matthew 28 the very last words before Jesus ascended into heaven. What did he say? Behold, I will be with you to the very end of the age. He is with you. He is with you. So closing thought as we look toward the Lord's table. Think ahead from Exodus 3 to another time in the Bible when this living God will have men take their shoes off in his presence just before working for their salvation. John chapter 13, as he himself, this God, who is the fire, the living fire, the unquenchable light, the light of the world, our Lord Jesus Christ, with our human eyes and our human ears and hands and feet, stooped down to do what? 
to wash the filthy feet of his disciples. Why? It says it at the very beginning of the chapter. Having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. And that you may know that he loves you like that. That he loves you to the end. He has taken upon himself for all eternity. Even now in heaven, Jesus Christ your Lord is in human flesh with eyes and ears and hands and feet and his eyes are upon you and his ears are open to your cries and he has seen your affliction and he has heard your cries and he came down so that he might know your sufferings so deeply as to experience them for himself as a man as his own ears heard the mocking against him as his own eyes saw the cross standing before him that would take his life, as his own hands and feet felt the piercing nails go through his flesh, that you might know and see that he loves you to the end. Let us pray. Lord, help us today to see you, to, to hear you, you are the living God. You have all life. Open our eyes and our ears and our hearts that we might know you and love you truly. And feed us and empower us and strengthen us as we continue the journey today, tomorrow, and throughout this coming week. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.